recording. Great. Hi, Dr. Schindel. Uh, hello, Daryl. Good to see you. Good to see you. And welcome to our conference. Thank you for being here. Uh, can you tell our audience what you do and where you do it? No, thanks so much, Daryl. It's, it's an honor to be here at this conference, virtually or otherwise. So I very much appreciate the invitation. Uh, my name is Dr. Alan Schindel. I am a professor of urology at University of California, San Francisco. My particular niche practice uh, is largely dedicated to the care of men with sexual concerns. Um, I was on the AUA guideline for erectile dysfunction, peyronie's disease, and I chaired the guideline on ejaculation disorders. I'm also a member of the board of the Sexual Medicine Society of North America. So sexuality, sexual concerns, uh, primarily in men, are kind of the, the cornerstone of my research and academic and clinical practice. And today we're talking about how gay men in particular, men who enjoy sex with other men, might mm -hmm. benefit from uh, consulting with a uh, um, medical professional like yourself. What are the kinds of treatments that men uh, concerned about erectile dysfunction and sexual dysfunction uh, approach you about? Yeah, well, sure. where I live, I actually have a very large uh, cohort of gay and bisexual men in my clinical practice. So I, I spend a lot of time caring for men of any uh, sexual orientation. And uh, the options we have, you know, the medical options that exist are pretty much universal. I mean, they can be applied to a man of any sexuality. There are particulars that may inform how we use them and what we expect from these different treatments, depending on the sexuality of the man using them. But the fundamental options are there's five big categories of things that are FDA approved, well time tested and, and considered standard of care and managing primarily erectile dysfunction, which is, I think, the main thing people come to talk to me about. There are other sexual concerns we can also address if you'd like, but let's focus on ED for the time being. Uh, the first and foremost, the one that everyone knows about are the oral PDE5 inhibitors. You know, classically, these are the drugs Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, and Stendra, which are the only oral uh, pharmacotherapies for ED that are available. Highly effective, uh, generally none of the generic, fairly affordable, work in many cases for people with vascular erectile dysfunction, less efficacious in the post-prostate cancer population because the mechanism of these pills is such that they're very reliant on nerve stimulation, which is something that, as probably many of you are aware, is impacted upon by most prostate cancer treatments. Well, let, uh, let's stick with that for a second, though. Sure. Um, many of the people sitting behind me virtually were told by their surgeons that they had uh, uh, nerve sparing surgery. Mm -hmm. I yeah. mean, if the nerves are spared, what's the problem with using uh, Viagra Cialis? Yeah, it's a tricky thing. And, and fundamentally, it's an important to understand that the nerve sparing approach, uh, which was developed in the early 80s and has become really the standard of care, is a vast improvement over what was done previously. So it is better than it used to be. However, it remains something that is not necessarily what you would hear from hearing the term nerve sparing. It makes it imply that, oh, these nerves are sitting there. And at the end of the case, there they are intact as they ever were. Unfortunately, the nerves that innervate the penis and drive penile erection are microscopic. You can't really see them. And surgeons who use the best you know, skills they can bring to bear on this do the best they can to move the tissue in which these nerves are embedded to the side. But unfortunately, these tissues are immediately adjacent to the prostate on either side. So even nerve sparing, what it basically means is that the surgeon looks inside and sees that that bundle of tissue to the side of the prostate is intact. However, to get the prostate out, even if the nerves are spared, they have been tugged on, they have been pulled, they may well have been cauterized to some extent because the, you know, the device has to be used to dissect the prostate away from them. It's a very subjective assessment of how much sparing of that tissue was there. And I think it's, you know, to the credit of the surgeons that they do the best they can to preserve nerves as best they can, but they really, they are limited to some extent. They have to get the cancer out. And they usually prioritize that oncological efficacy over preserving this bundle of tissue in which the nerves are embedded in some fashion. So um, it's probably a little bit of a misnomer. It is nerve sparing. It is not total nerve preservation, as it might sound the way it's billed. So is it fair to say that it may spare the nerves and that they're not actually severed, mm -hmm. but uh, it certainly disrupts them and... Uh, play shit with their heads you know yeah. if, if they can't communicate with the with you know from the top of the, your penis the glands to your head uh you're not going to really know the head's not going to be able to say fill up the veins and uh you know get an erection 
Yeah, so, I, I bottom line say the nerves get beat up. And it, the nerve sparing is more of an approach than an endpoint. It's more of a journey than, than a destination is that the surgeon approaches it in the modern era with the intention of doing the best they can to preserve nerves, but going in knowing that the rule, pretty much the rule is that after treatment like this, the nerves have taken a hit. And similarly, and by extension of that, erections will take a hit after surgery like this too. And that's sort of just the way it goes. My job uh, uh, after the surgery is over and you know the cancer part is done is to kind of establish where the man is, offer options to help expedite and make more complete the recovery. Uh, and there are options to help with that. But the rule is even nerve sparing surgery, most men will take a, a drop in their erections afterwards. And this applies to radiation too. I mean, radiation is not risk-free in terms of erection function outcomes. Um, bottom line, any prostate cancer treatment does carry some risk of sexual disruption. Can nerves sort of fix themselves over time organically without like uh, the use of medications or therapies? Yeah, we don't really have a drug that specifically restores nerves. So the various treatments which we can talk about later are kind of designed to keep the tissues at the other end healthy, at least ostensibly that's what they're supposed to be doing, while the nerves are given a chance to regenerate. And the regeneration process is not a, not a quick one. Basically, the nerve has to die and then theoretically regrow. And that's something that can happen, does happen to some extent, but once again, the recovery is usually a lengthy enough process and an incomplete process so that it's hard to really say, and it's hard to really say for sure that the nerves completely grow back to where they were uh, at the end of uh, where they were before surgery. And it's probably on, on the order of one or two years. You know, the, the number that I have in my mind, based on studies done by uh, my colleague and friend, Dr. John Mulhall at Memorial Sloan Kettering, is that you have maybe a two-year window of time during which there is some reasonable expectation that there might be improvement in erection function. Beyond the two-year part, maybe there'll be some improvement, but honestly, the new normal is where most men wind up at the two-year mark. That's kind of where you can expect to sort of plateau in terms of erection function and recovery after radical prostatectomy. Okay, well, let's move on. So you mentioned pills, mm -hmm. what, else, what else? So the pills are the simplest, easiest option. Uh, in terms of things that I think are highly efficacious, my second offering uh, is the penile injections. And this goes by a number of different names. You know, the uh, FDA approved versions that are available in most pharmacies would be Edex or Caverject, both of which are drugs called Alprostadil or prostaglandin E1. More frequently in my practice, and I think most practices, people will turn to compounded mixtures of different drugs, including potentially prostaglandin E1, but also drugs called papaverin and ventolamine. And these drugs are all vasodilators. You know, if, if you think about what an erection is, fundamentally, it's all about blood flow. So increasing blood flow to the penis can be accomplished by use of these injection agents. Uh, the advantage is, number one, it's very powerful. It bypasses the nerves. You know, we can talk about some physiology here if you'd like, but the, the oral pills are somewhat dependent on the nerves that go to the penis for their efficacy. So the injections, especially in the post prostate cancer patient population are better because they bypass the nerves altogether. They work directly on the vascular structures of the penis. So they can be highly effective even in, in prostate cancer patients. They tend to avoid systemic side effects, uh, which is another advantage. So uh, they have some selling points. Now, the obvious downside is it's a needle into the side of the penis. And, and many men, when they hear that, they have this initial like, no, no way am I doing that. Uh, honestly, the needle that's used for injection is tiny. It's 30 gauge, you know, the same kind of needle that people with diabetes use uh, to inject insulin. So most men honestly don't even feel it. And it is not technically challenging to do. Um, there's a small risk of bruising or bleeding, theoretical risks of infection, although I've very seldom have ever seen that. The biggest concern of this is, you know, the potential that it works too well, you know, uh, priapism, that is to say the prolonged erection, the four hour thing they talk about on the TV commercials for these drugs is seldom a, a thing we witness in men who are on oral pharmacotherapy for ED, but it does happen somewhat frequently in men on injections. So the principal caveat for men who are looking at injection therapy for ED is be very cautious in your dosing and definitely talk to your doctor or your healthcare provider about how to dose it safely. And if anything ever does happen that you get an erection that is lasting for three to four hours and is, you know, rock hard, you know, go to the ER, call your doctor. It can be fixed pretty easily, but the longer you wait, the harder it gets to fix. 
Right. And does it make sense? Uh, I mean, we so we've heard the three to four hour thing mm -hmm. as well. Uh, common sense sort of tells us if you're starting to if if you're not going down after two and a half hours or so, that's when you get in the car or the cab or, you know, or walk over to the ER because there'll be an interim of time between somebody mm -hmm. seeing you yeah. and you showing up or even getting there. Yeah. Um, so does it make sense to sort of reduce that three to four hour window to a little earlier? It depends where you live and how accessible your doctor is and what the ER looks like where you're, where you are. So, yeah, I, I think, again, it's out to eight hours is, is sort of the zone where there's still probably not going to be any long-term consequence from having a prolonged erection. So I don't want to say, oh, wait to eight hours. It's okay. But in light of what you just said, Daryl, and I agree with you, some of this, the four hour thing comes from the notion that, you know, okay, it's four hours now you're not going to get treated immediately. So even if you go to the ER right at the four hour mark, you're still going to have a wait ahead of you before something can be done. So I, I think that I don't object to people at the two to three hour mark, you know, sounding an alarm and reaching out and asking questions if that's the case. We want to distinguish that priapism or priapism, whichever way you prefer to pronounce it, is when the, the erection is, you know, very hard, you know, rock hard, unbendable, unsqueezable. It is not atypical after an injection that some men will experience a period of kind of a semi erection or a soft erection that persists for hours afterwards. So long as that's not painful, you know, the implication is that blood is getting into the penis. The, the, you know, the problem with priapism and the reason it's a problem is when the penis is that hard, fresh blood can't get in and the penis is basically being starved of oxygen and nutrients. So if it's semi hard, like a semi hard erection, but it's soft or bendable to some extent, it means fresh blood is getting in. So the penis is not in danger of taking any kind of damage because, you know, it's not in what we call an ischemic or non-oxygenated state. It's sort of like not taking a cock ring off after four hours. Right? Exactly right. Yeah. yeah. You can think of priapism as a cock ring from the inside. Ah, that's very well said. Uh, yeah, we I've never thought of that before, but it's exactly what it is to an exactly. extent. Excellent. Okay. So we've got something new today. Uh, the idea of... Um, uh, anal intercourse rarely mm -hmm. comes up uh, when people talk about erectile functioning in mm -hmm. general. So, so let's just look at uh, compare like pills versus uh, injections. Yeah. Uh, our experience in the support groups is that the pills rarely give a man who's mm -hmm. uh, top, you know, sufficient uh, hardness, sufficient power for uh, insertive sex. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Is that your experience with patients and for them, would you, for TOPS, do you think the uh, uh, injections are more appropriate? Uh, well, it depends. And ultimately, there is not a rank order to this. And, and some men find that one pill works well enough for them or, or the other. And many men want to start with the pills before they go to the shots. Short answer to your question, I would say yes. If you do require a greater degree of rigidity, you know, a harder erection to have the sex you want to have, which would certainly go along with, you know, engaging in topping, um, the injections are probably a more surefire way to reach that. And I think this is where it comes to be very important that uh, patients talk to their doctors about what they're doing. You know, as you're aware, and as people in this group are aware, and society is aware, there is sort of a heteronormative assumption that everyone's heterosexual, everyone's having, you know, penis and vagina sex. And obviously, that's not the case for gay and bisexual men, uh, by and large. So it's important that the, the physician be aware that, you know, what may be enough, you know, kind of a decent, if not rock hard erection that maybe would fit inside a vagina that was properly lubricated, may not be in enough of an erection to achieve anal penetration. So um, I, I would still offer both options. I would say many men gravitate towards at least trying the pill first to see what it gives them. Again, it is not mandatory. This is not like a stations of the cross thing where you must go through each individual treatment before you go to the next one. If you, if you go to your doctor and say, I'm not getting anything, I really need something that's hard. It may be best to skip the pills altogether, just go straight to the shots. I don't think that's unreasonable, especially for men who are primarily tops or exclusively tops. Right. And for guys who are just looking for blowjobs or hand jobs, mm -hmm. uh, the pills generally would be adequate or more reliable. Perhaps, yeah. I find a lot of guys, you know, they, they kind of figure that out ahead of time. You know, they kind of know what they really need to have the sex they want. And, and you're getting at a point here that, you know, there are some men who, you know, don't have anal insertive sex, you know, gay and bisexual men who don't either do insertive or receptive anal play. Uh, a lot of them already come in with the notion that, you know, I don't need to be rock hard to get a blowjob or, you know, my partner doesn't have to be rock hard to, uh, you know, for me to give them a blowjob or even a hand job. 
And so people kind of select the kind of sex they want. And I, I'll say that an advantage uh, that to some extent, a lot of gay and bisexual men who are prostate cancer survivors have many challenges too, don't get me wrong, but there have been publications on this. The fact that uh, gay male sexuality is perhaps less scripted, you know, in heterosexual couples, we think, okay, penis and vagina, that's the way you have sex, penis and vagina, that's the way you have sex. There's not this kind of, uh, there's a sort of rigidity to it, no pun intended, that that's the way sex happens. Whereas in gay men, obviously gay men have preferences and things they like, and they may be very particular about what they actually want to do with a partner. But there are data suggesting that in gay couples, especially long-term couples, the fact that there is not necessarily a set script for what sex between men looks like, there is some adaptability that goes along with this and sometimes enables men to have maybe not the sex life they had before surgery or radiation, but a sex life that remains satisfying and mutually uh, beneficial for both parties. Yeah, what considerations around like drug use and, and alcohol should men using either the uh, Cialis Viagra or, uh, or what, uh, any pill or um, an, uh, an injectable uh, have? Uh, for example, would poppers interfere mm -hmm. with either? Well, poppers would definitely interfere with PD5 inhibitors. So the, the drugs in general are very safe. You know, all the drugs that we were talking about here have been around for a very long time, you know, the early 80s in the case of the injections, late 90s in case of uh, Viagra and similar drugs. And the only real rules about the oral drugs is you should not take them with nitrates. So that would be a lot of cardiac medicines, you know, people for, for medicines with people with heart failure, people with angina, so chest pain with exertion. Uh, amyl nitrate or poppers are, are also things that need to be avoided with these because they can cause a very severe, very severe drop in blood pressure that can be life threatening. So that's really the only major caveat uh, amongst using the PD5 inhibitors. We don't see a lot of priapism. We don't see a lot of people coming in with erections or terrible side effects from these drugs unless they are mixing it with nitrate containing drugs, specifically including poppers. Not so much a problem for the injections because uh, we don't have the systemic effects. It's another advantage. As, as I was saying earlier, the injections are a local therapy. So any other drugs or you know recreational or otherwise that someone is ingesting around the time of injections will probably not have a major synergistic negative effect um, with the injection agent itself. Obviously, I, I don't condone or sanction necessarily uh, use of recreational drugs. I also know people do it. And there's generally very little harm in it. There are some concerns that obviously sometimes recreational drugs are taken in context, but they sometimes also are involved with, you know, less safe or unsafe sexual practices. Again, I just recommend that everyone, you know, uses, you know, their best judgment, uses things to protect themselves and their partner from STIs. Ultimately, people make their own decisions, though, uh, but there is not a lot of medical contraindication to other drugs and these erection drugs, aside from the one I mentioned with poppers. Sure. And um, the... Uh you know, needles sharing around mm -hmm. uh, the uh, injective, uh, you know, caver jets. Mm -hmm. uh, is it, aside from just, you know, a safety issue in terms of sharing a needle, uh, is there any problem with a man without a erectile dysfunction using a caver jet? Uh, a lot of men do for, you know, recreational purposes, or if they have a notion they really want to be, you know, diamond cut or hard, or if they just want to have extra confidence. And there are some data suggesting that erectile dysfunction drugs in general, not just in the case of prostate cancer or in the case of gay men or anything, can be very helpful at men who struggle with condom use. Um, you know, condom, nobody likes them. I mean, no one would prefer to wear a condom you know, in a perfect world, I don't think. But they are obviously important for protection of the man, protection of his partner. And sometimes these drugs can be used to sort of overcome that decrease in sensitivity that goes along with condom use. Uh, so some men without what you would technically call ED could use these drugs very effectively. Um, if a man wanted to have multiple sexual encounters, again, there's nothing saying that the drugs wouldn't work for that or that they can't be used for that. One caveat to that and one concern I have is that in a man who does not have ED, they may have a very robust response to the injections and that could put them at higher risk of priapism. Priapism, as I said, is pretty rare with the pills because the pills are very reliant on sexual arousal. You know, if you're not sexually aroused, the pill doesn't really do very much for you. So that's an important thing to know about use of the pills. There are some rules to make them work better. And if a man is at the third or fourth hour of his erection and it's starting to hurt, usually the arousal starts to take to taper downwards and the erection starts to go away and the pill is not really having that effect anymore. 
but it is a risk for the injections that regardless of arousal status, the erection will persist because it's very pharmacologically induced. So there's a greater danger of privacy. That's the main thing I would be concerned about. And a man who doesn't otherwise have ED using these kind of drugs, the injections. Yeah. And I, I hear people saying, ask them about orgasms and orgasms mm -hmm. and orgasms. And we'll get to that in a second. Sure. The, uh, uh, what's the next uh, offering you have for people? Okay. So there's two options that I don't particularly care for, but I'll, I'll go through them for completeness of sake. One of them is uh, the vacuum erection device, colloquially known as the penis pump. Uh, it's a, a device that many people are familiar with. It's just a plastic cylinder or some, some other cylinder that the penis is placed inside. And then by use of an electric or a hand pump, a uh, vacuum is created around it, and that's the name. And venous blood, you know, blood from the venous circulation is pulled into the penis, so it becomes what I would call a firm, but not really hard erection. And to maintain that, you know, once the vacuum is relieved, the blood is naturally going to want to rush back out again. So it's necessary to apply a cock ring or other kind of constrictive band at the base to keep the blood trapped on the inside. Now, it's a very safe option, assuming you don't pump it up to 11 and, you know, potentially put yourself at a very high vacuum pressure that could cause bruising or bursting of blood vessels. Uh, you're not going to damage yourself with these things. And assuming you don't leave the ring on for more than an hour or so, similarly unlikely you're going to do anything terrible to yourself. But the issue I run into is, number one, it's a bit of an apparatus. You know, some people don't care for the point that they have to take it out and pump it up and it feels very mechanical and somewhat unnatural. The erection itself, as I said, it's not really a hard erection, it's firm. Uh, getting at your point earlier, Daryl, you know, is it gonna work for anal penetration? Probably not, probably not by itself. It may not work for any other kind of penetration, oral sex, conceivably, uh, vaginal penetration, hand job, maybe, it, it could work for those kind of things, uh, but it won't be the rigid erection that most people are wanting. And, and beyond that, it's also pulling in venous blood. So as you may know, venous blood is blood that's already been through the circulation. It's on its way back to the heart and the lungs to pick up fresh blood and ox fresh oxygen and nutrients. So it, it's kind of a colder, bluer, softer erection. And again, this combination of both a little bit of awkwardness using it and an erection that's kind of meh. I, I've seldom had men come back to me and say, hey, that was great. I, I really like this thing. I'm going to keep using it. I, I, I've, had, I've seen it happen. And for people who have sex infrequently and just don't want to take medical risks, it's not a bad option. It is considered a standard of care, but in my experience, it's not one that many men go to or stick with very long. No, and uh, it reflects the experience that we've, before COVID, we had like 82 in-person support groups just focused yeah. on gay men. I think, you, I mean, universally, all of the guys with the vacuum pump thing um, sort of give it up after yeah. a while. Yeah, it's not, it's, it's hard to sustain with it. There is a suppository, a urethral suppository called the Medicated Urethral Suppository for Erections, Muse, which I think the name is the best thing about it. It's a great name for, in my mind, what's kind of a so-so drug. Uh, it is prostaglandin, so the same constituent ingredient that's an in EDEX and Caverject. So it has a rationale. It is FDA approved. It does produce an erection to some extent. But once again, my experience with it clinically has been that many men who use it say that it, it hurts, you know, probably hurts more than the actual injection hurts because you're putting it inside the urethra, pretty tender part of the body. And you have to do this kind of uh, fire starter maneuver to, to dissolve the pellet once it's in the urethra and it absorbs into the tissues. It can produce an erection, but once again, it's not something that's usually terribly rigid or durable or reliable. Um, so it's, it's something that if you're going to go down the route of using prostaglandins, I usually prefer to say, hey, why don't you just inject it where you want it to go Do this little tiny needle? You'll get a better result and it'll probably cost less too. Mm -hmm. So I, I mentioned this for completeness's sake. Uh, I, I don't prescribe it very often, if ever, frankly. So those are the medical options, the pills, the shots, the vacuum pump, and the pill in the penis. The fifth option that is still considered a standard of care would be surgery. Uh, placement of, a, of an inflatable penile prosthesis most commonly. Uh, that's 90, 95% of what's done in this country. There are alternatives, basically malleable uh, rods made of titanium and silicone that can also be placed in the penis and they're much simpler. There's no inflation device. But most men in this country, because insurance will pay for it, will go for the inflatable, which basically recapitulates what a natural erection feels like. So basically two cylinders, one on each side of the penis, a pump that is in the scrotum, kind of like a third testicle of sorts, and a reservoir which is placed either behind the pubic bone or another space kind of tucked up inside the body. And when the man wishes to have an erection, you basically push up the pump button, the erection goes up, 
when sex is done or you just want to get rid of the erection, you push a release button and it goes back down again. It's a very neat device. It's been around since in, in the modern incarnations of penile implants. It's been now almost 50 years that these devices have been around. They've gotten obviously much, much better uh, with time and development of materials and experience. Uh, they've gotten to be very reliable, very durable devices. It is surgery to put it in, which is something many men aren't really into at this point. If they've been surgery, they've had prostate surgery already, they don't want more. Um, it has some of the general risks to go with any surgery, including bleeding or infection or injury to adjacent structures. Uh, it's a bit of a learning curve, learning how to operate the device, because even though it's a simple concept, you know, I just illustrated all there is to it is just a simple pump. But when it's inside your body and it's a sensitive part of your body and you just had surgery on it, it can be a little tricky to learn how to use it at first. The most common gripe we hear, and, and the thing that you really have to go into this knowing about is that it is never going to be as long as a natural erection. Uh, we, we commonly hear men tell us that. And a lot of the time I get the story like, oh, I used to be 10 inches long. And I'm like, well, maybe you were, maybe you weren't. You know, it, that's, I, I wasn't there, so I can't testify to how long you used to be. But what I can tell men now when they come in to talk to me about their uh, implant possibility is that the stretched length. So take your penis away and pull it away from your body with moderate tension. That is the approximate length you can expect to get. And you're right. It's not going to be probably as long as you used to be. It may not be as long as you can get away with if the injections or the pills would work for you, which is why I tend to steer people towards those. If the pills or injections work, they may be better options. But if they don't, uh, the surgery is a really nice way to go. And ultimately, I think many men would prefer to have a four inch stiffy versus a six inch floppy uh, for the kind of sex that most men want to have. So if you think about it in those terms, if nothing else is working, if a man really wants a rigid erection that he can use for whatever kind of penetrative sex he wants, the implant surgery can be a very nice option to consider. The, the implant surgery is sort of like um, a do or die kind of thing. Like if you do it, uh, you can't go back to have it removed. I mean, you could have it removed, I guess, but you, then Cialis and the pills and the injections become less effective. That's absolutely right. Basically, to, to place the device, you have to insert it into the erectile tissue of the penis inside of the two, what are called corpora cavernosa, which are the erectile bodies. So it's, it's a point of no return. You know, once you get an implant, you are committed to that as the means to get an erection for the rest of your life. And the thing is, it's a mechanical device that eventually does break down. Uh, usually what happens is a, a hole forms in part of the tubing and the saline all leaks out. When that happens, it can be replaced. I mean, we do uh, revision surgeries or replacement surgeries when it's necessary. And the timetable for when that happens is variable. I've seen implants fail after two years. I've seen them last 17 years. So there's a lot of variability depending on how a man uses it, how frequently, how hard. Some of it's just luck of the draw, how durable the device happens to be. But generally speaking, they're pretty durable. I mean, they will last on average, if you read the studies, about at least 10 years or more. So uh, they're a good option. Again, you have to go into it with reasonable expectations, though, about what it is and what it's not. It won't save a failing relationship. It won't change climax. Uh, it won't make you 10 inches long and have beautiful people showing up at your door ready to have sex just because you have this device now. I mean, it doesn't do any of those things. It gives you a rigid penile shaft, but sometimes that's all that's missing for a couple or a man or a man and any of his partners to, to get back to the, having the sex they like. Yeah. And it's, a, it's good that we don't have advertisements that show men with the, with beautiful people showing up to look at. The, yeah. Uh, yeah. I've had, I've had patients expect that they were shocked when all of a sudden beautiful, this was a heterosexual patient, but he was shocked that beautiful truckloads of women weren't suddenly showing up at his hot tub. And I was like, well, <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, let's return to the, I'll call them the pills and the injections. Mm -hmm. Uh, how do they impact uh, urinary control? Well, it's interesting. Um, the injections are easy. They don't really do anything to urinary control. They're just an on-demand therapy that is used for um, erections. Uh, the pills, PD-5 inhibitors, the class of drugs to which Viagra and Cialis and Levitra belong, are drugs that have been investigated as ways to treat benign prostate enlargement, or BPH. And of that group, Cialis, the long-acting drug, which is available as a daily dose option, has actually been FDA approved for the management of BPH, you know, prostate enlargement and urinary symptoms related to it. Now, post-prostate cancer patients no longer have a prostate. So it's not something that is really clearly indicated for any of those reasons. None of the drugs reliably have any 
discernible effect or universally, you know, demonstrable effect on urinary continence, uh, which is something that a lot of men who've had prostate cancer surgery struggle with, at least initially, you know, trouble controlling urine flow can be something that's quite common. Um, in terms of stress urinary incontinence, I'm not familiar with any data saying that any of these drugs have a negative nor positive effect on, on that aspect of recovery uh, for, for any of the prostate cancer populations. Sure, because urinary control is a huge impact on sexual enjoyment and pleasure, Absolutely. especially. When, yeah. Well, and we will get to orgasms in a brief few minutes or so, and we will talk about the impact of radiation therapy uh, and what uh, Dr. Schindel and his colleagues can do, can help you with. But now let's just think about how you met, let's say, measure gay men versus straight men. I mean, the, the instruments that uh, we use uh, in, you know, surveying whether a person's sexually happy or not, mm -hmm. they're all geared for straight men, you know, mm -hmm. for heterosexual things. Uh, how do you talk to your patients? What do you want your patients to tell you about uh, what turns them on, what gives them pleasure, and what they hope you'll be able to help them with? uh regarding uh, being top bottom or mm -hmm. anything around that yeah i mean you're, you're getting at the notion there are a lot of validated instruments to measure erectile function so that would be the international index of erectile function the sexual health inventory for men also known as iif for shim the edits which is the edit, uh, erectile dysfunction inventory of treatment success uh, you know, these tools are very useful for research, and, and truthfully, there have been some forays, you know, there have been some investigators who have piloted, tested, and, and studied the use of adapted instruments that are about, you know, gay men, asks about the kind of sex that gay men have, uh, and ask questions about anal, you know, do you have anal insertive sex, do you receive oral sex with masturbation, I mean, it's a bit more inclusive. Not in wide use, to be honest, and just something that is not necessarily caught on the way it perhaps should have. You know, my experience is, you know, these tools are really good for research and they can be useful for icebreakers in a, in a general urology office. The thing is, by the time the patient comes to see me, they know we're going to talk about sex. That's what I do. So I don't necessarily have to have this kind of intermediary step like, okay, let's now start talking about the sex stuff. It's like, hey, let's talk about sex. That's what you're here for, right? So we kind of skip the preliminaries, you know, skip the foreplay and let's talk right about what's going on with you. And I, I don't find those tools very useful at that point. You know, my question is more like, hey, tell me, you know, I usually start my conversations with, tell me what's going on with your libido, with your ejaculation, with your erections, you know, with the shape of your penis. Do you have a curve? Do you have peronies maybe? And obviously it's an open-ended conversation that can go any direction, you know, after I've asked these initial inquiries. And sometimes we don't even get to all those because we're start talking about whatever it is initially. But then it comes down to me asking, well, what are your goals? I, I usually try to bake into this a question about, well, tell me about your partner. And again, I always say partner because I never know if someone has a partner. I actually sometimes you say, do you have a sexual partner? And allow the patient then to elaborate to me on um, who their partner is. If they tell me that they are gay or they tell me if they have a male partner or anything else like that, I usually follow it up with, okay, well, what kind of sex do you have? Or what kind of sex do you want to have? What kind of sex have you had? Because I really need to establish, again, I'm guilty of this as anybody that I, in a heterosexual man, I'll usually just assume, okay, you want to have penis and vagina sex. And that's probably an over assumption in my mind. I probably shouldn't do it that way, but I, I tend to just because it's easier and usually true. When I encounter a man who probably has a sexual life that doesn't involve penis and vagina sex, I do open it up to say, well, tell me about what sex is to you. Tell me about the sex you want. Because that does help me understand better what are the various options I have to offer you are going to be the best fit. And, and to your question earlier, Daryl, if a man tells me, you know what, I am a top through and through, and all I want to do is have, no, not all I want to do, but when I have sex, all I want is to be an, uh, inserting my penis into my partner's anus, and that's what sex is to me. Then I'm going to talk to that guy about, you know what, let's, let's talk about what's going to give you the best chance of success there. And it's probably going to be the injections if he's not getting any kind of response right now to what he's done thus far. But it, I leave it open for the patient to tell me rather than a survey instrument. Right. And do you just ever directly ask somebody about what kind of sex they're going to have or want to yeah. have yeah well i mean oh, yeah. if they're gay or straight um yeah yeah i have you know generally speaking i want to know what they're doing because again it's, it's useful to know orientation because it has a lot to do with identity and culture and there's things that go along with having a, a, a gay identity that go beyond just who do you have sex with so it's, it's good for me to know that context and understand where someone's coming from mm -hmm. 
But again, from the kind of reductionist biomedical approach that I have as a simple country urologist like I am, is that I really just want to know where do you, what do you want to put where? You know, that's kind of what is important for me to understand because it helps me decide or help provide information that will inform that man about what's going to give him the best chance of success of putting his penis or his partner's penis where they want it to go. Right. And it's good to know that San Francisco and uh, your hospital are just country facilities and such. So, yeah. I, but better that, I mean, really good that you say or ask or concerned, what do they want mm -hmm. to do? Mm -hmm. I mean, 99 out of 100 times when I've had a conversation or do a grand rounds over the last two decades, it's focused on the here and now or the past behavior. Mm -hmm. But men, even in their 60s, 70s, 80s, present with fantasies mm -hmm. and present with desires right. and that they're coming in diagnosed with prostate cancer and, po and in your office post-treatment, uh, they're already thinking like, what do I want to do before I die? Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, so you could have the straightest presentation of a heterosexual couple with a loving, adoring female wife, you know, holding the guy's arm and shoulder and, and being very supportive and such. But between that guy's ears, he's thinking he wants to have sex with George Clooney and, you mm -hmm. know, or, or whatever. And he, or, or two guys who mm -hmm. shine shoes down the street. Mm -hmm. What, how do you tease out what your gut tells you is the guy in front of you, either your patient isn't, you know, has something sheltered inside, but it would be useful for you to know in order to come up with the most appropriate therapy. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a good question. And ultimately most of the time I'm having these interactions in a, in a private setting, uh, the partner is sometimes there. And obviously if the partner is there, it implies they're invested and care about the process. So I'm assuming that they're a part of it. Um, the man may have secret fantasies that he has told his partner. Um, obviously those are things that I'd like to know about, uh, to some extent, but I'll also be say that honestly, you know, my role, and again, I don't want to be overly reductionist about this because I do a lot of sex therapy kind of off the cut. I'm not a sex therapist, but I have to be able to talk to people and kind of give permission and, and let them tell me what they're thinking and what they're feeling. Um, you know, for me, helping them reach their goals primarily has to do with what can I do to get them a, an optimal and functional erection for whether it's sex with George Clooney or the two guys down the street or with your wife of 50 years or all the above. You know, my main role and what I can do to support that is to give them the options to help them get the erection that they need. And it's kind of up for them to decide what kind of erection is that or isn't an erection at all. Sometimes they just want to know what the options are. And they might decide that none of them are really interesting or appealing. And they say, you know what, I, I'll find something else to do. We'll cuddle, we'll do hand jobs, we'll do oral sex, we'll do something else. But none of this stuff sounds good to me. And that's okay. I mean, there are not rules about this. I just try to make sure that men understand that there are options. And I am a big fan of emphasizing transparency and communication. Because I think communication is kind of the secret sauce to a lot of sex. You know, it's, it's, it's shocked me to me how often men of any orientation have not talked to their partner or partners about what they want. They haven't had a real conversation about what the goals are. You know, there's a lot of kind of, you know, shame or embarrassment or, or fear of, of having those conversations. And to some extent, my job, not as a real sex therapist, but as just sort of the permission giver is to open up the thing and say, Hey, you know, have you talked to them? Have you seen a sex therapist? Maybe you should maybe it'd be good to have that conversation and have a referee present, which is what the sex therapist can do to help facilitate these conversations about making clear what are the someone's sexual desires? What do they hope to achieve and what do they want? And I would hope, you know, I, I don't know if it's always true. I would hope that in general partners can be very transparent with each other. Um, if there's a committed trusting relationship, it's, it's, it's okay to have hard conversations. Again, no pun intended with that, but have conversations about things that maybe are uncomfortable because then you break through to, hopefully get to a new understanding that is better for all parties about what people want sex to look like. For bottoms who have enjoyed um, orgasms as a consequence mm -hmm. of prostate massage mm -hmm. or prostate touching through penis or finger or, or tool of some sort, peg or whatever, yeah. what can they expect after surgery realistically? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's difficult to say. I mean, Anal penetration for many men is, is enjoyable because of the prostate simulation that goes along with it. 
there can be enjoyment simply from stimulation of the anus, which has numerous nerve engines endings and is, is very you know sensitive and if properly treated can be a very tingly erotic organ in and of itself. Um, but you're right uh, to, to the man who is a bottom or exclusively a bottom or bottom. Sometimes it's versatile and enjoys anal penetration because of the impact it has on his prostate. Um, it's something that ideally um, it probably doesn't happen often enough that that comes up during the conversation and people aren't necessarily informed about what to expect. And yeah, it, it could have a very major effect. You know, it can have a very deleterious effect on someone who is now missing this organ that had so much to do with what they enjoyed about, you know, being anally penetrated. Now the prostate makes semen uh, and the seminal vesicles make the rest of what most of the, what the rest of it was in semen. So it does not have a fundamentally essential role outside of procreation. It doesn't mean it's not an erogenous organ and it is not strictly speaking necessary to trigger climax in general, although there can obviously be exceptions for individual men who find that that kind of stimulation is really what gets them off. I wish I could say I have an easy answer for, for men in that circumstance, but fundamentally we're talking about removing a, a very important erogenous organ. And I think probably what matters most of all is that the conversation is had up front, you know, between the man and the oncology, the oncology surgeon, that this is potentially going to have a negative impact here. And this is I, hopefully best accomplished in a circumstance where the man can be transparent and tell his surgeon, you know, what's, what his preferences are for sex. I think here at UCSF, we live in a city that is very LGBTQIA friendly, so it, it's much easier to have the conversation. But I know many men are in circumstances where really it's probably hard to, to bring this up with their doctor. So I think that's where things like this become very important, where people can turn to resources like you have, Daryl, to, to kind of get some inside scoop on, you know, what does it mean for a bottom to have prostate cancer surgery or prostate radiation? Um, I want to, I want to, build on that a little bit you know we've talked all about surgery pretty much but you know the thing about radiation um prostate cancer surgery generally has a lot of effects on sex and urination not as many on bowel function at least not long term because you're not talking about doing anything to the bowel but with radiation therapy either external beam or from brachytherapy there's always some scatter of radiation so it is more frequently the case that men who have had radiation of some type for their prostate cancer may experience more rectal urgency, fecal urgency, uh, potentially blood in the stool or from the rectum. And this is another thing that for men who are at least sometimes bottoms uh, can be very important to know because that can have an impact on their enjoyment of sex. Let's say their prostate is still there. They avoid this thing I talked about earlier about, you no, know, your prostate's gone. This erogenous organ is no longer there at all because it was surgically removed. Radiation might seem more appealing on the surface by not taking that organ out. But there can be other rectal or, you know, perianal consequences of radiation therapy that make it sometimes challenging for people who, who bought them. Right. So stereotactic uh, radiation therapy um, is, com is, is now like the talk of the town within mm -hmm. the mail care world. Yeah. Um, is, the, is it fair to say that that's an, uh, a, a wiser choice for most, if not all, gay men? I would say that in general, the right kind of treatment is whatever is going to give you the best chance of beating your cancer. And I think there are a number of really good options for that. And I think that progressively, you know, I talked about how surgery has gotten better from definitely from the before the 80s and definitely better as time has gone on. Radiation's improved too. You know, if you look at radiation as it was done in the 60s and 70s, which is like, here's a giant beam of radiation we're just going to blast your whole pelvis with. And that was a pretty miserable thing to live through. And there were a lot of long-term consequences from that. The radiation oncologists like the surgeons have only gotten better. And that's probably due to the aid of computer software to help us target things and aim better than we used to. That the radiation is very much focused now on the prostate itself. So yes, I am, I am all for stereotactic radiation therapy. I'm all for whatever is involved with targeting and narrowing down collateral damage. So I would say that that's probably a good way to go because it's available now. All right. But in both cases, surgery and radiation, ejaculation is history. Yeah, with, with, with surgery, definitely, because as I mentioned earlier, 90 to 95% of what's in semen comes from the prostate and seminal vesicles. So if those organs are gone, there's really nothing to make semen anymore. Uh, some men uh, will experience expulsion of a small amount of kind of slippery fluid that comes from the bobo urethral glands, which are actually in the penis. 
So there can be a little bit of, you know, some people think of it like pre cum which is kind of what it feels like. It's kind of what this, these gland secretions are. Some men will have a uh, leakage of a small amount of urine with sexual climax after prostatectomy. And we're talking maybe a, a teaspoon or maybe two teaspoons worth. It's urine is the cleanest thing that comes out of the human body. So there's no real particular risk to a partner from exposure to that beyond what's already in the human bodily fluids. It's obviously not something people are really comfortable with in many cases. Um, but it is something that some people will equate with the ejaculation experience and it happens at the time of orgasm. So it's kind of like that, but it's not really semen. With radiation, once again, you're not removing the organs, but because they are irradiated, their, their capacity to create seminal fluid is, is markedly reduced. And that is a, a thing that you can kind of expect that pretty much any prostate cancer treatment you choose is going to have an impact on ejaculation. I actually wrote a paper about this. I invited commentary for the Journal of Sexual Medicine some years ago. And what I was able to deduce reading the literature is that obviously men like ejaculating. I mean, this is a, a dummy statement. Men like ejaculating. I mean, beyond the orgasm, which is the, the mental feeling and the excitement and the pleasure, um, which is obviously something that everyone likes, ejaculation itself has a lot of meaning to men as yeah, sort of a receipt or an evidence of, of, you know, sexual excitement and, you know, men tend to fetishize semen and not ubiquitously, but definitely more so even than in straight men uh, amongst many gay men, there seems to be a very much uh, an interest in semen and, and a desire and a, and a valuing of semen as part of the erotic experience. So, in all the talk about, okay, you're going to have prostate cancer surgery, are you going to survive? That's what most people are thinking about. On the second and third place on their minds list, they're thinking about, am I going to be able to get an erection? Am I going to be able to control my urine and not have, have to wear diapers? I mean, these are the top three things. And that's where we spend most of our time talking uh, before prostate cancer surgery. I think what gets missed is that concern that we really don't think so much to talk about what's going to happen to ejaculation afterwards. And that can be, even though it seems intuitive and natural, and of, of course, from our perspective, of course, you're not going to ejaculate. If it's not made clear, it can be a real shock and an unpleasant one for many men, again, of any sexual orientation, but perhaps more commonly in gay men, that loss of ejaculation can be a, a, a big deal. Yeah, for both uh, the, mm -hmm. uh, the partner as well as the diagnosed guy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a, a realm of ejaculate play mm -hmm. that yeah. will be gone. But there's also the sense of, you know, the as we've all experienced to one degree or another, that shooting of mm -hmm. semen, that liquid, that mm -hmm. sort of is the... Um, the bell that tells us we've just orgasmed. Yeah. So. Well, it's the receipt. It's the visual evidence of climax that again, yeah. and that's why in most, you know, explicit media or porn, if you prefer just to call it that, that's where it ends. It's like, okay, here's the receipt. It happens. And, and that's kind of where it, this is the sign that the bell, I think it's a perfect term that you use. So that's what kind of tells us sex happened here and someone had a climax. And that's, isn't that great? And that's gone after, after prostate cancer treatment. And that's, a, that's not a trivial matter. Not at all. So in our remaining five or 10 minutes, let's talk about what people are, the whole point of all this conversation is to have a penis that can get, tell our brain we've just come, mm -hmm. you know, orgasms. How does any of this affect the, the nerve bundles, nerves that uh, tell us we've had an orgasm? Well, the neat thing is, I mean, orgasm happens in the brain. Um, and for most men, for most of our lives, they are synonymous that ejaculation and orgasm are the same thing. And that's the way a lot of the literature is written about it too. But ultimately it is, it is possible to have an orgasm without ejaculation. It is possible to have an orgasm without an erection. Uh, it really just comes down to arousal and, you know, arousal is a composite of both circumstances, you know, what you're seeing, what you're thinking, um, how you're feeling about your partner or about whatever else is going on in life with an integration of what's happening physically to your body. Um, and you know, what sensations are you getting? So for most men, this means they're having sex, you know, they're looking at their partner, they're looking at their partner's body and they're enjoying that. They're enjoying the sensations of, of someone touching their penis or being penetrated by a penis and then having their prostate stimulate. So again, all these different things. And again, what the threshold is, is, is variable from person to person and what gets someone off varies from person to person, obviously. It just comes down to, again, at some threshold point, we don't fully understand why or how, but at some point the trigger is set off that orgasm happens. So 
when you, you come into a situation, again, no pun intended, where a man has gone through prostate cancer treatment, some of those stimuli that used to be present, such as prostate stimulation for a bottom, such as the feeling of a rigid penis inserted inside a partner's body in their mouth or their anus or any other part of their body, it may be less sensitive. So there, there's probably a need for greater degrees of stimulation, you know, more intense stimulation or more intense fantasy or just something else to kind of try to, again, elevate the level of arousal to the point that, again, that reflex clicks in and the man experiences an orgasm. It's safe to say that in many cases, most of the time, orgasm becomes different, perhaps less intense, perhaps, you know, less pleasurable even. Uh, the extreme cases that I've seen men who experience it and a friend coined this term, a woman I know coined the term as a pelvic sneeze, where it feels like a reflex, something happens, but it's not like, oh, that was, that was it. It was just kind of like a, a thing that you felt something happened, but it was not at all what any of us conceptualize as an orgasm. And uh, I keep on saying this. I, I wish we had something. We don't have an orgasm pill. We don't have a drug that reliably augments or enhances or expedites the arrival of orgasm. And remember what I said, reliably. There are data on a couple of different drugs that have been investigated and are available clinically and have some body of evidence supporting their use for men, primarily who have trouble reaching climax, so an issue of timing, what we call delayed ejaculation. But there are some evidence suggesting they could also enhance or intensify some aspect of it, or at least help man, man cross that threshold of, of orgasm. So these drugs do exist. They are all off label. None of them technically approved, none of them approved by the FDA, all of them evidence-based to some extent, but a very weak evidence base. And it's something that really, if, if you're considering those kind of things, you probably should see someone who's, you know, really pretty deep into the literature and makes sex a big part of their practice. So like a member of the Sexual Medicine Society of North America, or you know, that most of us in, in uh, North America who do a lot of sex men are part of that group. So someone who's in that organization and is at least probably privy to some of the, the cutting edge, you know, kind of not quite, well, not quite experimental, but kind of um, beyond the standard of care, things that are available or options to be discussed, if not necessarily embarked upon. You want to find a physician who can do that. And one nice thing, you know, the silver lining of all this COVID stuff we've been through is that it is, in many cases, easier to access uh, doctors who have expertise that may not be always available in every location. And that's part of what I think telehealth has done for us, that it's kind of opened the door for people to access people who may be willing to work a little bit outside the lines in terms of treating these harder to treat issues, such as difficulty with orgasm after prostatectomy. Well, what are the drugs that you're talking about? So some specific examples, and again, I'll just list them, not in any particular rank order, but cabergoline, which is a drug primarily used to suppress prolactin producing tumors. It does have an effect on uh, dopamine, which is a, a neurotransmitter that has a lot to do with orgasmic responses and sexual responses. It generally potentiates those kind of things. Uh, again, I just want to reiterate to be very clear, this is not FDA approved for this indication. Um, it is an off-label use to prescribe it for orgasm issues. But I have done that myself in my own practice, and there was a paper out of Baylor University where they reported on a group of men, not prostatectomy men, but men who had issues with orgasm, who benefited from it. I'll leave it at that. You know, some other medicines that exist in this class would be oxytocin, another neurotransmitter that has a lot to do with pelvic floor contractions, used very widely in uh, labor for people delivering babies, but has effects, you know, pelvic contraction is part of what goes on with orgasm. So there's a rationale there for it. Uh, some other kind of case report things, um, SSRI type drugs generally have an anti-ejaculation effect. So some of the alternative antidepressants such as bupropion and buspirone uh, have been used in very small randomized studies comparing their effects on orgasm and ejaculation and suggesting some degree of benefit. Uh, and then a couple of case reports about things like amantadine, ciproheptadine, again, kind of unusual drugs that we seldom prescribe. So again, reiterating here, there's not an orgasm pill that the FDA has said, this is the orgasm pill and it helps you reach climax for whatever reason. But because of our understanding of physiology and our limited but somewhat present understanding of how orgasm works, we can use that knowledge and apply it to pharmacotherapy for uh, orgasm issues. What I always emphasize, you know, before we start, you know, going off, off script in terms of the medicines we prescribe is that I, I ask people, hey, you know what? Even definitely in the post prostatectomy population, in general, they will have the same conversation. 
work on things that are going to intensify arousal for you. So that could be fantasy, role play, conversations, dirty talk, going to the adult store, looking at what's there, seeing what's appealing, what's acceptable, what you and your partner might like to do together, explore with something new, different sexual position, different sex toys. Maybe if you haven't done anal play before, uh, gay or straight, if you've never made anal play part of your routine, but you're still having trouble and you're now trying to figure out different ways to reach climax, maybe add it in, see how you feel about it. But license to kind of experiment and play and explore and, and putting in mind also that the point of sex is it's supposed to be fun. I think men, men in particular, women too, probably to some extent, but men in particular oftentimes fall into a trap where sex becomes performance. And it's all about how good I am and how much I can come and how far I can shoot and how long I last. And I'm so great. And I'm not saying those things are wrong to feel. It's not, it's not wrong to be proud of how good you are at sex. That's, that's a good thing, frankly. But I think taken to an extreme, I think men very easily fall into the trap where it's really all about performance, not about pleasure. So I really want to emphasize to people that keep in mind, regardless of the particular kind of sex you're wanting to have and what's going where during sex, keep in mind that it, aside from procreation, sex is supposed to be fun. And if you get so fixated on the performance of it and less so on the pleasure and the intimacy and the other emotional and emotional things that go along with sexual relationships and contact, in many cases, that's self-defeating. You know, you kind of lose the forest for the trees when you just become so fixated on one particular aspect of what physical intimacy between people means. Yeah, but for many men, uh, performance runs tandem to identity. Mm -hmm. uh, gay men, particularly older gay men who are who've lived through both the Stonewall period, mm -hmm. uh, the HIV crisis, mm -hmm. and now uh, are seeing assaults on their identity whenever there's a, a disease that affects their sexual mm -hmm. sexual uh, behavior, their sexual functioning. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, straight men don't have that issue. Mm -hmm. um, heterosexual men don't have that issue. Uh, but men who have sex with men, men who want to have sex with men, men who fantasize about it, the opportunity to be a man who enjoys the pleasure and company of another man in an intimate way when you don't have the ability to create intimacy mm -hmm. through your body. You, you both question and are challenged by who you are. You know, am I a gay man if I can't have sex with another man? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's where your work comes so vi becomes so vital for mm -hmm. uh, LGBTQA, I plus, et cetera, community. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's about restoring a person's hood, mm -hmm. a person's self, yeah. uh, along with uh, the pleasure and uh, the fun and the ability to connect. Mm -hmm. um, do you see that in your practice that uh, gay men have a heightened sense of despair around loss of sexual function? Uh, they can, you know, and, and here's the thing, though, is that I, I, I hear what you're, I agree with you, Daryl, that a, a big part of identity for, for many gay men is the performance aspect that I can have sex with men and that's who I am. And it's such a part of who I am that if I can't, this center part of my identity is, is lost. That's been written on and reported on. Um, I've met heterosexual men are kind of the same thing. You know, I, I met a man who said to me, uh, if, please pardon my language, I'll just quote him verbatim. What he said to me was, he came in, he was somewhat aggressive. He's like, doc, I'm just going to be straight with you. The most important thing in my life is fucking. And I was like, oh, okay. And, you know, and, and so he didn't say it to be mean. He wasn't trying to pick on me. He was just saying like, look, this is who I am. This is all I am. Not all I am, but this is the thing that is me is sex. And it, it came down to, again, recognizing what this meant. You know, this was a heterosexual man, but it, it could happen to a man of any orientation that when sex is such a core part of identity, it, losing it is, is a huge deal, disabling deal. It feels terrible. And it just came down to, again, recognizing where he was you know, seeing that for this man, 
you know, the pleasure, the fun, the excitement, the intimacy. I mean, that's all well and good, but the core thing that he needed was a penis that he could use to penetrate. And that was what for him was the priority. So getting back to what we talked about at the very beginning, what are the goals here? Well, if the goal is I want to be with my partner and I want to snuggle and I want to feel close and, you know, if we have an orgasm, that's great, but I mostly want to be physically intimate. That guy, okay, you know, we, we'll, we'll do what we can, but we won't feel obligated or that he won't feel obligated that he has to go all the way to get a rigid rock hard penis. This other guy or some of these other men who say that, you know, if I can't have sex with my penis, uh, penetrating a partner, I'm, I'm not who I am anymore. That's the kind of guy who's going to need to go further. He's going to maybe need to think about the injections or even the implant to get back to where he is to be who he is. And that guy and I, we, we formed a great bond. You know, we got off to a good start and, you know, he kind of asked me at some point, how did I get into this line of work? He was a bit surprised because I come across as a relatively kind of sedate, boring, uh, you know, professorial type sometimes. And I said, well, the most important thing in my life is, you know, I, yeah. I kind of implied the same thing. The most important thing to my life is to helping people uh, fuck and then being someone who can help them reach that goal. So that's a really animating principle for me well, is being able to help people, you know, reach these goals, which again, a lot of doctors aren't comfortable talking about it. A lot of doctors, you know, are, you know, sex in general is uncomfortable for people, let alone doctors. Uh, but part of what I find important is meeting people where they are and providing them what they need to have the sexual life, to be the sexual being they want to be. Uh, and that's a big part of why I think what I do is important. Yeah. Uh, is it, you know, it's, it, and you just sort of trigger something that just continually astounds me, the difficulty that people have in talking about sex with each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, if anything adults have in common with each other uh, exists, it's sexual behavior. Mm -hmm. I mean, food, but food is local. Right. You know, I mean, you, you get spicy food versus you know, eating whale blubber or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but whether you're in Greenland or Mexico, you're having sex more or less the same mm -hmm. way. And the goal is an orgasm. Yeah. Uh, and the conversations don't exist around that. It's remarkable to me. It's a big so, part of being human that we don't talk about nearly enough. Yeah. As we close this down, what, what are the and wonderful conversation. I hope our audience has some helpful hints and uh, you know uh, ideas to bring back to their doctors and uh, so perhaps feeling validated by some of the things we've discussed. Uh, if it's reflected in their own experience, what are the questions that you want patients to ask? What are the things that you want patients to say to you? Uh, at least to feel comfortable saying to you that will help you to help mm -hmm. them. Yeah, uh, I think, again, the main thing is I know a lot of medical stuff. You know, I know literature, some on sex therapy and, and relationships, but what the patient brings to me is their perspective, you know, their goals. And, and unlike, you know, say high blood pressure or cancer, where the goals of treatment are very clear, okay, I have high blood pressure, I don't want to have a stroke. What can we do to get it down? I have cancer. I don't want to die. What do we do about it? You know, there's sort of a, there's one outcome that we're both going for here. And it's very clear that this is the thing we have to fix or solve or, or treat or get rid of or whatever. I think sex is in the category of lifestyle thing, which is a critically important part of being human and a critically important part of life. But as we were talking about earlier, what sex means to me versus you versus anyone else or any patient I see, it's going to be a little different. I mean, it's going to be not one stereotypical sex goal that we're all going to have that we go to see our doctor to, to try to try to meet reach. So what I need patients to ask me questions about, you know, it's not so much a question that what I need them to do, and it's my job to help facilitate it and make it comfortable for them to do that is to tell me, what do you want? You know, what is the goal here? You know, what are we trying to accomplish? And and what kind of sex life, not just what did you have before, to your point about maybe fantasies that are unrealized, not just what did you do before, but what do you want to do now? And, and what do you, or what are you willing to do to get there? And so that's where I can provide the information on, the, on what I think is the best way forward to achieve those goals, whatever they might be. Uh, balancing efficacy and safety, you know, is what I'm going to propose safe enough. Is it worth the risk of doing a surgery? If a rigid direction is not essential. If the rigid direction is essential, then well, maybe surgery is the way to go because that's what you're going to need to get back to being who you are. Dr. Schindel, thank you for your time. Thank you for the care you give your patients. Um, 
thanks for helping people learn how to fuck better and uh, creating opportunities for those who are damaged as a consequence of saving their life from prostate cancer, uh, that they can uh, have a restored sense of self and uh, sexual activity so that they could uh, live a longer and happier life. Yeah. So thank, thank you for all of that. And um, welcome to our conference and welcome to Male Care's faculty. You know, thank you so much. Faculty. Well, it, it's a privilege and honor to do the work I do. And it's been a privilege and honor speaking to you, Daryl. Thank you very much for the kind invitation and the opportunity to speak. I hope you all have a great conference. Thank you.